Review copy provided by PlayStation. Video games are no stranger to the feudal Japanese setting, but thinking upon it, there does seem to be a distinct lack of grounded AAA action-adventure samurai games. Recent releases such as Neo and Sekiro tend to lean more towards the fantastical, mythological, and supernatural. So in comes Sucker Punch Productions, who aim to challenge that convention. Stylistically inspired by Akira Kurosawa films and narratively based on real history, the studio decided to tackle the genre with a more authentic approach. It's a complete departure from past endeavors such as Sly Cooper and Infamous, one that intrigued millions when the title was first announced back in 2017. Almost three years later, the highly anticipated launch of Ghost of Tsushima is finally upon us. I played roughly 38 hours of the game, encompassing the main story and an array of side quests with more still left to complete. Let me tell you, if you're a fan of open-world action-adventure games, I really think you might want to check this game out. This is easily one of my favorite games of 2020. The year is 1274. The Mongols have initiated their invasion of Japan, starting with the island of Tsushima. Overwhelmed by superior Mongol forces led by the mighty and merciless Kotun Khan, Tsushima is brought to its knees, and the samurai are driven back to make their last stand on Komoda Beach. You are Jin Sakai, head of Clan Sakai. Left for dead and with his uncle Lord Shimura taken captive by the Mongols, Jin embarks on a quest to rescue his uncle and reclaim his homeland. Tsushima as a setting is, man, nothing short of stunning beauty and breathtaking splendor. This is without question one of the most majestically realized open worlds I've ever had the pleasure of exploring. I don't think I've stopped this many times in a game to just bask at the scenery around me. The star of the show is the foliage. Fields of beautifully rendered grass and colorful flowers are accentuated by realistically swaying trees and particle effects of leaves blowing in the air. Authentically realized Japanese villages and temples dot the land to further add to its splendor. Individual leaves strewn on the ground dance with the wind. Whether bathed in sunlight or cloaked by moonlight, whether walking on foot, riding on horseback, or scaling cliffs, the game world rarely failed to astound. But the land of Tsushima stands corrupted by the Mongol invasion. Villages, temples, and farmsteads are overrun by Mongol forces, and Mongol camps stain the beautiful land. That's where you come in. Much of the game's quests revolve around taking back occupied territories, and to that end, much blood will be shed by your katana. I really came to love Ghost of Tsushima's combat system. I was worried that it might look too good to be true in the marketing material, that it might not play as well as it looks, but boy was I glad to be wrong. It did take some getting used to, but once I got the hang of it, it was consistently engaging and quite in-depth. True to how samurai fight, there is a heavy emphasis on measured precision. Button mashing and flailing about is simply not an option. Even in the late game, a few good strikes from enemy forces will be enough to kill you. The key to victory is to study the enemy's moves and counterattack with the maneuvers that the game will gradually teach you. Initially, combat felt a little stiff and rudimentary to me. Light attacks dealt damage, heavy attacks broke enemy defenses and staggered them. Holding down and releasing the heavy attack button performed a powerful attack, and I could also block, parry, or dodge to fend off different types of enemy attacks. But then the game started introducing samurai stances, each of which are effective against the game's four distinct enemy types, swordsmen, shieldmen, spearmen, and brutes. Each stance has its own unique attack patterns, attack types, and maneuvers. Learning to switch stances on the fly while gauging when to strike different enemy types with which attack type and reading enemies' choreographed moves to block or dodge as needed are all paramount to overcoming hostile encounters. As you attack, block, and dodge enemies, you'll also build up what's called Resolve, which can be spent at any point to heal or perform certain special attacks. Another layer to combat is ghost techniques. Believing that the rigid ways of the samurai won't be enough on their own to overcome the Mongols, Jin adopts more backhanded tactics to complement his swordsmanship. You'll start to unlock tools such as throwable kunai knives to stagger or kill enemies, sticky bombs to throw at specific targets to damage them and those nearby, grenades to deal devastating AoE damage on enemy clusters, smoke bombs to blind foes for a quick escape or to stun them for assassination finishers, and more. 
The bow is particularly invaluable and can be quite the lethal supplement to combat, especially as you become accustomed to pulling off headshots and unlocking a few arrow types. Ghost weapons and tools can be quite powerful when properly taken advantage of, but you can't just spam them. Ammo capacity is quite limited, so that encourages players to use them strategically in moderation. Jin will eventually come to have quite the array of tools and maneuvers at his disposal, with the game doing a good job of steadily introducing them as to not overwhelm players. Once I got used to efficiently combining samurai and ghost techniques, the combat system really came alive and flowed beautifully. There was a great satisfaction in slaying entire groups of enemies unscathed with measured and precise usage of sword techniques, samurai stances, and ghost tools. Combat also just looks really freaking cool. There's a lot of detail in the combat animations that give every encounter a stylized cinematic quality. I particularly appreciated the implementation of standoffs, the samurai equivalent of cowboy fast draws, which can be optionally triggered upon approaching groups of enemies. With proper timing, you'll be able to execute multiple enemies at the start of combat with cinematic panache. How visually appealing, striking, and all-around badass combat is really does add to the satisfaction of mastering the systems. Combat looks especially cinematic during 1v1 duels against some of the more formidable foes, which take place in more intimate and environmentally striking battle arenas that begin with this cinematic standoff sequence, leading into a much more up-close and personal camera angle. From the artistically jaw-dropping visuals of these battle arenas, to the intense and captivating music, to the fun combat challenge these boss battles can offer, I couldn't get enough of them. I did notice that some of these duels would feature repeat attack patterns and moves though. It would have been nice if every duel felt completely different, but even so, I always looked forward to these dramatic duels and encounters. My one major complaint about combat is a lack of a lock-on system. You'll have to rely on pointing the left analog stick in the direction of your targets. It did work most of the time, but there were occasions while fighting larger clusters when Jin attacked the wrong enemy, which can be quite detrimental given how much combat emphasizes using the right stances and techniques for the right enemy types. Furthermore, there were times when the camera wasn't facing the direction I wanted, so I had to briefly stop everything I was doing to take my thumb off of the face buttons and flick the right analog stick in the appropriate direction which could break the flow of combat and could feel a bit cumbersome. I did eventually become accustomed to the lack of lock-on and was able to perform admirably in combat, but there were occasions in which I definitely wish there was some kind of a lock-on system in place. I also found that changing stances on the fly could at times feel unresponsive. To switch stances, you bring up a wheel by holding down R2, and then you press the appropriate face button. If I pressed R2 and a face button consecutively too quickly though, the stand switch would not register. I had to be a little more deliberate about those button presses than I felt was ideal, especially in the heat of battle. Now there will be scenarios in which a stealthy approach as the ghost may be more prudent and viable. Much like with combat, stealth felt somewhat one note in the early game, but my experience improved as I unlocked useful tools and abilities like throwable wind chimes to distract guards, chain assassinations to silently execute multiple enemies at a time, greater enemy sensing distance and crouching mobility, and more. On top of that, as my ability to gauge the trajectory of arrows improved, so did my ability to land headshots to silently take enemies down from a distance, which never got old. Exploding rooftops to deal death from above felt especially useful. Jumping and vaulting over objects could feel a little floatier than I'd like, but it worked as intended more often than not. And in stealth, if you're able to jump far enough to be right above an enemy within melee range, you are able to trigger assassinations, which means you can easily nail enemies who might start walking away, or enemies who might be a bit far from your location. I would definitely say that the samurai combat gameplay was more compelling than the ghost assassin gameplay, but ghosting through and clearing out an entire enemy camp did come with its own sense of fulfillment. Assassinations in the game are swift, efficient, and brutal and enemies will die in one hit with any stealth strikes or headshots. There is none of the Assassin's Creed RPG, the enemy is higher level bullcrap to diminish the effects of carefully planned assassinations. You will encounter a bigger enemy type known as leaders who you can't one-shot assassinate initially, but this eventually changes in the mid-game. I did encounter some frustrating moments with stealth though. When prompted for an assassination, there were times when Jin would perform a regular attack instead. Also, single assassinations and chain assassinations being mapped to separate buttons often led to me stealth killing a single target 
and then getting detected by someone else nearby who I felt I should have been able to kill with a follow-up button press or button prompt. So instead of making it square for single assassinations and triangle for chain assassinations, the game should have made it so that you can press square and then press square again if there are other enemies nearby. That would have worked a lot better. But some unfortunate moments aside, for the most part, I felt powerful assassinating targets so swiftly. I feel the game straight up does Assassin's Creed better than Assassin's Creed. Enemy AI was generally acceptable. During stealth, there is the typical thing in video games where enemies have unrealistically poor sight and hearing, and the stealth AI in the game is nothing exceptional, but I did find that some of their behavior could be dangerous enough to add tension. For example, if you kill someone within visual range of another enemy, if the enemy stumbles upon a dead body during patrol, or if you near miss an arrow shot, enemies will sense hostile presence and warn the whole base, which will then put enemy patrol in caution mode and make their patrol patterns harder to navigate around. During combat, enemy AI felt relentless, attacking in groups often enough and forcing me to keep my eyes and ears peeled for cues indicating incoming melee attacks or incoming bow and arrow shots, forcing me to think quickly on my feet, all while juggling the numerous techniques, stances, and tools at my disposal. There's a lot to keep track of, and the aggressive enemy behavior meant that I had to maintain constant concentration and focus, especially during some of the larger encounters, which made combat consistently tense experiences. Keeping stealth, combat, and core gameplay fresh and exciting throughout my whole playthrough was a non-stop sense of character progression. Aside from unlocking techniques, stances, and tools, you can also upgrade them by spending technique points, earned by playing missions, killing enemies, or engaging in open-world activities, to enhance their efficacy via the game's comprehensive skill tree. So for example, parries and dodges can be upgraded to be more effective and eventually allow for perfect timing for powerful counterattacks. Stances attacks can be enhanced to deal more stagger damage or to bolster their ferocity. Ghost weapons like kunai, grenades, sticky bombs, and smoke bombs have their own additional effects that can be unlocked. And the bow and arrow can be upgraded with a slow motion reflex mode ability for better aiming, just to name a few. Another form of progression is the ability to upgrade your weapons and armor. You'll find resources throughout the world that act as currency that can be spent on leveling up gear to improve things like damage for your blades, various facets of your bows, the ammo capacity of arrows and ghost tools, or the statistical effects of the various unique armor you'll find in the game. Note that the katana and tanto will be your sole primary weapons throughout the entire game, and there are only a handful of unique armor you'll acquire throughout a playthrough each of which do have different inclinations, be it better defense, better offense, better stealth, and some extra effects here and there. Ghost of Tsushima is not a loot-based RPG where you'll be discarding and swapping gear. Instead, the game focuses on fewer gear that you can get more attached to and invest for the long term. Every new gear in Ghost of Tsushima is viable and in it for the long haul. Weapon and armor upgrades are infrequent, requiring substantial amounts of crafting materials, but at the same time, each upgrade does feel pretty major. Another layer to character progression is what are called charms, passive upgrades that can be placed in slots to enhance your character with additional passive upgrades and abilities. The world is also littered with activities that upon completion further boost your character's attributes. Slaying enemies roaming the open world will grant you some XP, or legend increase as it's known in this game. Following foxes and finding Inari shrines will unlock additional charm slots. Completing environmental obstacle courses to get to the big shrines will give you the game's most powerful and unique major charms. Finding hot springs will increase your max health. Participating in the Bamboo Strike minigame will increase your max resolve. And clearing out Mongol-occupied areas will grant technique points and or crafting materials. Other activities focus on giving you cosmetics. Finding what are called Pillars of Honors will grant you cool new skins for your katana and tanto. Finding spots where you can craft your own haiku from a few preset lines of poetry will reward you with different headbands, which are cosmetic gear for your head. With the haiku minigame being something that I found weirdly calming and enjoyable and contemplative, returning to gift altars every once in a while will give you different masks or face wear you can equip alongside a major infusion of crafting resources. And you'll occasionally find things like straw hats out in the world that you can wear. You can also apply cosmetic skins to armor and weapons by collecting flowers and purchasing dyes from merchants. New cosmetics will also be granted upon completion of certain quests and storylines. So yeah, suffice to say that there are plenty of good reasons to explore this gorgeous world. Your trusty horse will be your best friend when it comes to world navigation. With the horse controlling well enough, 
though in topographically rougher regions it's best to go on foot to climb rocks, scale surfaces, and swing yourself across platforms and the like. Another form of navigation is the ability to fast travel to any discovered location. Something that seriously impressed me was how quickly the game loads compared to most open world titles. Fast travel actually felt, well, pretty fast, which made exploration much less of a hassle and that much more intuitive. One of the most ingenious features of the game is the wind navigation system. If you have a point of interest selected on your map, you can swipe up on the PS Force trackpad to summon the wind for guidance. It's essentially a compass that seamlessly blends into the world and even enhances the beauty of the game with how fields of trees, flowers, grass, and leaves mesmerizingly sway in the direction of your destination. It's a simple thing, but I think it's freaking genius. You may also stumble upon chirping golden birds, which if you follow, will lead you to undiscovered locations and points of interest. Another great method for the game to dispense with HUD elements and provide a guiding hand in a way that does not disrupt your immersion in the game. More often than not, the wind will likely be guiding you towards the game's quests, of which there are four varieties. There are main quests, character quests, side quests, and mythic tales. Main quests are pretty self-explanatory. They advance the Mongol invasion plot and Jin's core character arc, and this is where you'll find the game's most epic set pieces. Character quests are these multi-part stories that center around a key supporting cast. Side quests are smaller stories and tasks that usually involve helping nameless or lesser NPCs. Most of these were admittedly not particularly memorable, they tend to be simple in their narrative, but can serve as nice distractions and can grant some decent rewards while also providing tidbits of additional context about the state of Tsushima Island amidst the Mongol invasion. And finally, mythic tales delve into some Japanese mythology and it's how you obtain some of the game's more powerful techniques as well as many of its unique weapons and armor. It should be noted that throughout my 38 hours with the game, I did eventually start to feel repetition in quest objectives. Almost every quest involves a combination of some or all of these things, moving from point A to point B on foot or on horseback, investigating a scene, tracking and following footprints, tracking down or trailing an NPC, surveilling an area to plan out an attack, raiding, clearing out or infiltrating an enemy base, fighting against large groups of enemies or enemy waves, and or engaging in 1v1 duels. The repetition was noticeable, but I never found myself feeling like the experience got stale or overstayed its welcome. The involved combat and constant sense of progression kept the gameplay fresh and fun. Some of the main quest set pieces and the 1v1 duels broke up monotony, and almost every quest felt like it rewarded me in a significant way. It helped that every quest marker on the map told me exactly what I'll earn for completing an activity, which allowed me to pick and choose activities that I wanted to prioritize. Nothing's really level-gated. You can go almost anywhere and do any side activity in any order. Granted, the map is divided into three distinct districts, and two of the districts are locked starting out and only become accessible after key story beats as Jin and his forces push northwards and take back key castles bridging these regions. But I actually liked the gradual way in which the world opened up. It made for a more well-paced open-world experience that never felt overwhelming. The quantity of side quests also did not feel excessive. Plenty of open-world games out there tend to drop players in an overly expansive open world, padded out and littered with cookie-cutter side quests, but Ghost of Tsushima's map feels like it was just the right size with the right amount of side quests. What really took me by surprise and kept me emotionally invested was how compelling the game's narrative was. There is the core plot that centers around the conflict between the samurai and the Mongols, with Jin forming unlikely alliances as he plans invasions and seeks to kill Kotun Khan once and for all. Kotun Khan, by the way, ended up being a genuinely memorable and detestable villain, and I was driven by the same sense of divine retribution that Jin felt needed to be exacted on him. But more importantly, Ghost of Tsushima's story is one with a lot of heart, one that emphasizes characters as much as the overarching plot. This tale is as much a Tsushima story as it is a Jin story, whose conflict centers around the internal war between his two selves, the samurai and the ghost. Jin was raised and brought up as a samurai by his uncle, taught a very specific code of honor, but following the Mongol invasion, as the situation gets more desperate, as tragedies unfold around him, Jin begins to bend that code and use methods unbecoming of an honorable samurai and more reminiscent of a shady thief. 
starting to believe that the samurai code may be too rigid and may be holding him back from doing what's necessary to take Tsushima back. Gradually, legends will spread about the ghost of Tsushima, and there's a constant tug of war within Jin's conscience as those around him support or question his actions. There will be characters and NPCs who will come to revere the ghost, and there will be those who will come to fear and admonish him. It's a tug of war that the game presented quite effectively with Shades of Grey. It's a character-driven conflict that also beautifully ties into the gameplay itself, which sees you as the player gauge whether you should confront enemies head-on honorably or take a stealthier and more brutal approach. I don't want to say much more than that as to not spoil Jin's arc, but there is a strong character-driven narrative here, with the father and son relationship between Jin Sakai and his uncle Lord Shimura being in large part the heart of this journey, one that packed quite the emotional punch by the time credits rolled. I also came to grow quite fond of Jin as a protagonist. He came off a bit generic, one note and stoic initially, but as the story unraveled, more of his personality began to shine through. I became quite invested in his relationships with key characters. I sympathized with his hardships and burden, and he felt like a fully fleshed out, three-dimensional character. I was equally compelled by many of the multi-part character side quests which focus on a small supporting cast of characters coping with the fallout of the Mongol invasion. Some cope with loss, others with betrayal, others with survival, and many of these narrative threads I felt concluded in poetically thought-provoking ways that genuinely pulled at my heartstrings. There is also plenty of banter and dialogue exchanges between Jin and key characters, both in cutscenes and when just walking or riding around from place to place during quests ranging from endearing backstories to them arguing and questioning each other's decisions, all of which was bolstered by really good performances combined with often mesmerizing cinematography, visuals, soundscapes, and the music. My god, the frickin' music. Ghost of Tsushima is presented like a samurai soap opera with romanticized and melodramatic moments and elements, but it's melodrama that felt intentional, well thought out, nuanced, stylized and effective in execution. There were times, however, when the game did cheapen out with cutscenes. For some of the less important cutscenes and dialogue, the game relied too heavily on these rudimentary wide shots with characters just standing there with dialogue overlaid. It felt like they didn't have time to fully animate every cutscene and that these wide shots were meant to hide these scenes' lack of detailed facial and body animations. Compared to the myriad fully fleshed out cutscenes with damn good models and animations, these felt jarringly lackluster and out of place, appearing more frequently than I'd like. But when the game is cinematically running on all cylinders, it's truly sublime. My biggest criticism of the game is that I do think it could have used more polish. There will be times when objects in the environment would flicker with white flashes as I'm walking around, like they're loading in and out or something. A few times, assassination animations would not link up properly. Other times, I'd walk around to find that idle NPC animations would load late. There were a handful of those cheaper looking cutscenes that really did not look or sound right. I won't betray him. During world traversal, there would be inaccessible surfaces that led to the character unrealistically sliding off of them, or Jin getting stuck midair in between rocks before the game corrected itself. Oh, and there is uh, this fun little moment here. Keep in mind that bugs like these weren't so frequent that it ruined my experience, but they were noticeable enough that I'd be remiss not to point them out. Technical woes aside, there's just no denying that the game's achievements, for me at least, far outweigh its flaws. I loved most of my time with this game. I still can't get over the breathtakingly beautiful world, the immersive world navigation and exploration elements, the authenticity to Japanese culture and folklore and the game's attention to detail, the badass and cinematic combat that I had a great time mastering, the solid and satisfying assassination mechanics that provided generally a sense of empowerment, the numerous side activities that blended really well with the feudal Japanese setting, the surprisingly outstanding and emotionally impactful story, the compelling protagonist and the myriad supporting characters who were also compelling in their own right, and the gorgeous and stylistic Kurosawa-inspired presentation. Ghost of Tsushima to me is sort of a dream AAA samurai game and a lovingly crafted homage to the genre. 
It doesn't break new gameplay ground per se, but it sets out to evoke a uniquely captivating identity, vision, and style that's beautifully executed and felt to me like it breathed new life to feudal Japan video games. It is in my humble opinion that this game will be loved by many open world action adventure enthusiasts. I'll say it again, for me, it's one of my favorite games of 2020, and dare I say, it's a strong contender for Game of the Year.